you very much for joining us. My name's Rebecca and I'm the Marketing and Customer Service Manager here at Biomond. But I'm joined this evening by our expert guest speaker, Dr. Leanne Atkin, who's going to be presenting for you. Now, before we formally begin the webinar, there are a few quick points that I'd just like to run through with you all to make sure the webinar goes as smoothly as possible for you. So this evening's session is going to be all about venous ulceration. We're expecting it to last around about an hour, but we will set aside some time at the end just for any questions that you may have. Now, I can see lots of you are saying hello on the chat, which is brilliant. Hi, everyone. Um, but if you haven't joined us on a Biomond Live webinar before, um, and if you're not familiar with Zoom, um, there is a chat button and a Q&A button just at the bottom of your screens. And you can use the Q&A button just to type in any questions that you've got as we go through the session this evening. Now, as I said, our expert guest for this evening is Dr. Leanne Atkin. Um, Dr. Atkin is a vascular nurse consultant at the Mid Yorkshire NHS Trust, but she's also a lecturer at the University of Huddersfield as well. So a lot of experience and knowledge to share with you this evening. Now, Leanne's presenting for you on venous ulceration. Um, she's going to be discussing the anatomy of lower limbs, um, what venous ulceration is, who is at risk of it and why. She'll also be looking at the importance of individual assessments for you, as well as the ways in which venous ulceration can be treated. Leanne will also be discussing why timely wound bed preparation is key. And lastly, we'll be looking at the role of larval therapy in patients with venous ulceration. So that's it from me for now. I will stop screen sharing, Leanne, just so you can join us on screen and then share your screen for everyone. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can Fantastic. hear you. Brilliant. Um, a strange message came up about default microphones that I didn't oh. particularly like. It sort of worried me. <laughs> Thank you technology. for that kind introduction. Uh, my name's Leanne Atkin uh, and I'm a very passionate um, leg ulcer clinician, let's say. Um, I am a doctor, but a doctor by PhD. My background is nursing and, and I still love my job as a clinical nurse. And I'm down and dirty in Leg Ulcer Clinic three days a week. So it's my absolute delight to be here tonight to represent Biomond, to be able to present really this session on venous ulceration, really thinking about your role in terms of assessment diagnosis and how you can use larval therapy to help progress your patients to Towards healing. So I just want to start by really setting the scene of, of, of what are we talking about and, and I love these slides because it really starts to bring home actually how much money is used in managing these patients with wounds. I appreciate that I'm showing you NHS figures so UK based and I know that we have quite a bit of a global reach with Biomond um, but you'll find these quite similar no matter where you are based. I think though... Apologies that... Leanne to interrupt, I am sorry. Um, I know you've got some slides to share with everybody at home this evening but at the moment I can't see your screen. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's for okay. Me. No problem um, at and, all. And that, that's a rookie error and hopefully you can see them now. Oh, we can. Thank you, Leanne. Fantastic. Best of luck. Thank you. Um, so um, this slide really sort of demonstrates the widest burden. And who would have thought really that the management of wound care is up there really in the top five spends across the NHS? And I think the one thing to take from this diagram really is if you look at the amount of money we were spending to care for these patients in 2012 and 13, how much has that increased over just a five year period from 2017 and 18? The costs are rising. So we're currently spending around £8.3 billion every single year on the management of these patients with wounds. And when we start to break that down, actually, the biggest burden of wound care comes from wounds on a lower limb. Around a third of all of these wounds actually are lower limb wounds. And if you look carefully at that diagram, there are some things that really concern me. So you've got 16% of wounds that are unspecified and 9% of leg ulcers that are unspecified. It worries me that in that in those two groups could actually be venous leg ulceration that's undiagnosed. And a venous leg ulcer is an, with being undiagnosed is very unlikely to have that evidence-based compression therapy. 
So this session today is really going to focus on that management of those patients with venous ulceration because around 1.1 million patients across the UK currently have active venous ulceration. And why do we need to focus on those? Well, it's because actually the data that we're getting in terms of how many patients that we're healing in a year is terrible. So this originally was done in 2012 and 13, and we were only healing 47% of patients with a venous leg ulcer after 12 months of therapy. In the newer publication, looking at 2018 data, actually we've got worse at this. We're now only healing around 37% of our patients with venous leg ulceration after a whole 12 months of therapy. So again, things are getting worse rather than better. So why is that? Well, the problem is, is that there is such an unwarranted variation of practice across the healthcare services. We know that there is a poor recognition of lower limb ulceration, so being treated as a skin tear or a dehistergical wound, not recognising that underlying pathophysiology. There's certainly an uneasement about nursing staff particular making that diagnosis that this is a venous leg ulcer. Unfortunately, many of the pathways that we use and the policies that we're working with actually form a delay. If an ABPI is 1.4, you have to refer on. And, and we move people across a waiting time, if you like, but that doesn't help that patient getting that timely diagnosis. And then there is an underuse of evidence-based practice, strong compression therapy, venous ablation to actually cure them of that underlying venous hypertension. And there's an overuse of ineffective treatments such as compression less than 40 milligrams of mercury. Reduced compression, light compression is not therapeutic for a patient with a venous leg ulcer. So, so there's many reasons why this is happening and hopefully at the end of this session I will have skilled you up, improved your knowledge and confidence to get better at all of that. The reason why I find it really frustrating is that actually Within nursing, there's many things that we don't know. Nursing very much is an art rather than a science in many areas. But actually, when it comes to venous leg ulceration, we have a very strong evidence base. We know that strong compression works, comes in many forms, but we know that that heals the patient with the venous leg ulcer quicker. The Venus 4 study looked at the use of compression hosiery kits, so two layer garments versus multi-layer bandaging and found that actually they heal as well for patients with active venous leg ulceration. And then there's two other studies which many wound care clinicians are not aware of, the EVRA study and the ESCAR study. Both of these were looking at the role of venous intervention to cure that underlying venous hypertension. And actually both of those studies showed that the use of those therapies heal the patient quicker, and prevent the risk of recurrence. And I'll be touching on that a little bit more as we go through this session. So in effect, all of this evidence shows us that what we need to do is to treat a leg ulcer like a weed. We need to really stop focusing on the actual wound itself. And what we need to focus on is the underlying venous insufficiency, the venous hypertension that's causing this wound. And you can see quite clearly in that picture, that visible varicosity going all the way up the great saphenous Spain on that side that's feeding that leg ulcer, if you like. And just like you wouldn't go into your garden to chop a weed off with a pair of scissors, we need to tackle the roots. We need to tackle the roots of a patient with a venous leg ulcer. We need to concentrate on eliminating that venous hypertension. So, it's really the current practice shows that actually in reality we're only healing 37% of patients at 12 months. But I can show you multiple randomised control studies where we simply provide evidence-based care and we can get healing of 86% at 24 weeks. So it is possible to have a different landscape for the management of these patients if we changed our practice.
And that's hopefully by the end of this session, you'll be on board with me about it. So I think I'm, I'm quite a practical person. I like to be able to picture uh, what's going on. So I can't talk to you about venous disease without giving you a little bit of a recap in terms of anatomy and pathophysiology. So I just want to remind you that when we're talking about circulation, we're talking about the arteries providing the blood supply and the veins returning the blood to the heart. But these is, it is not a closed system. One does not truly impact on the other directly. What we've got to remember is that the gaseous exchange takes place in this capillary bed. And it's there actually where the majority of the issues lie. It's where this arteriovenous connection is. Because in that capillary bed, there is a complex system. And intertwined within all of that is the capillaries, uh, the lymphatic capillaries. So the drainage system from your leg. So if you just take a moment to look at that picture, imagine having venous hypertension so greater pressure in that blue system. And you can imagine the backfill of that pressure into that capillary bed. And once you get that back pressure, you can start to leak those blood products into that surrounding system. And that's when venous hypertension starts to become really problematic. So just to recap on those veins, there's two, the, the vein system in your leg really is separated into the deep uh, system. So there is a femoral vein and a popliteal vein that runs near enough next to the bone and it's encased by muscle. So yes, they can be affected by things like deep vein thrombosis, but your deep veins are often protected from enlargement and hypertension because they're supported by this muscle layer. The veins that most affected by venous reflux is those superficial veins because they've got no muscle holding them in place. So they're just there underneath the subcutaneous layer of the skin. So they're allowed to expand. And there's two um, major superficial veins in your body. There's the great saphenous vein. That's the longest vein. It runs down your thigh. Um, and there's the short saphenous vein, which runs behind the knee. And all of these veins are connected by a quite complex capillary network. So what should happen is the blood within the superficial venous system goes through the perforating veins. It's called the perforating veins because it goes through that muscle layer and drains into that deep system. So everything should run in a one way format with these non return valves throughout it. So the blood chugs up nicely causing us no issues whatsoever. The difficulty is though, is that vein composition is very different to arteries. Arteries have got a medial wall that's full of muscle. So they're designed to take that pressure such as from a blood pressure. But the vein wall doesn't contain so much muscle fibres. So it's much thinner and much weaker and is not able to actually expand and come back to where it is. Unfortunately, if it's gone under sustained pressure, what happens is the actual lumen of the vein just gets bigger and bigger. Within each vein, around 10 centimetres of each length, there is a bicuspid two valve system that allows the blood only to move in that one way direction. And you can see on this cross diagram where I mean in terms of how those deep veins are protected because they're covered with this muscle layer. And it's the perforating veins that connect this to the superficial veins that are sat just underneath that skin. Venus return, though, is quite amazing if you ask me. I understand how blood gets from my heart down to my toes because I've got a massive pump here pumping it down. But if the system isn't closed, it's really interesting to think how does the blood at the base of your toes return to your heart? Because it's going against gravity. And the answer for that, truthfully, is the majority of the blood returns by activation of the calf muscle pump. 
So you get this force, if you like, from the muscle movement onto those superficial veins to drain through the perforators and to push that blood back up that deep system. There's a little bit of venous return caused by the movement of the diaphragm, but most of it is actually from movement of the calf muscle pump or the foot muscle pump. And when you start to think about that, you think you start to understand why venous disease is often in combination with reduced mobility, because they've lost the biggest power. They've lost the pump, if you like, to move that blood in a one way direction. And unfortunately, over time, the veins can, if they're under sustained pressure, the veins start to dilate and therefore the blood gets moved into both directions. Venous pressure is really dynamic. It, it changes dramatically. When you're lying down because of gravity, the pressure in your veins is practically zero. But when you're stood or when you're just stood still, the pressure in those veins can increase around 80 millimetres of mercury pressure. Think about having a blood pressure cuff on your arm at 80 millimetres of mercury pressure. That's a lot of pressure inside that vein that that vein wall has to keep in place. So it doesn't come to great any surprise that many patients start to exhibit signs and symptoms of venous reflux. So this is where we get that dilated vein and that higher pressure within that venous system. And if left untreated over time, that venous hypertension can reduce in chronic venous insufficiency or chronic venous disease. So over time, the vein starts to dilate, you get higher pressures, you get that visible varicosity, and eventually that they can widen substantially. So venous insufficiency means that the valves aren't working as they should, and that's either because of the failure of that pump action, it can be because there's a blockage in the vein, but unlikely in the superficial veins, and often it's simply because of failure of those valves. Those valves are allowing the reflux, so the higher pressure starts to exhibit, and you see the signs of the highest pressure around the gator region, because that's where the venous hypertension is. So any of you that's working in terms of venous experts, you will know that there's lots of different manifestations of venous disease. These are some of them, but this session today is really gonna talk about that chronic venous disease in terms of that chronic venous insufficiency. So for you and me, what does venous hypertension look like in terms of a patient? Well, it can look like legs just like this with significant varicosities on them. And those significant varicosities can start to exhibit signs and symptoms. Signs such as aching and tiredness in the legs feeling of a burning sensation around that gator region. The legs feel tired, heavy, and then you can start to develop skin changes, um, including itching, discoloration, and finally you can lead on to things like ulceration. The risk factors for developing venous disease is like many things. It is more um, common the older that you get, much more common in patients that are obese or immobile because of that failure of that calf muscle pump, or they're simply carrying around a larger volume of blood. And it's much more um, common if you can see those visible varicosities, if they've ever had deep vein thrombosis, that will increase the risk of venous hypertension. And obviously if they've had previous cellulitis or previous leg ulcers, we need to be thinking about are they at risk of that venous hypertension. And this venous hypertension is quite a, a, a cycle, unfortunately. Once we start to see the damage on those veins, we start to actually lose the reflex and the constriction of those vessels. We start to change the cellular wall and the hydrostatic pressure. This causes a release of chemical inflammatory mediators degrades further evidence and further cells and increases all of this chronic inflammatory response. When I just said that, some of you may be thinking, good grief, that's difficult to understand. But I just want to break it down to you in a simplistic, more easy to understand term. 
These are all scales of venous disease and within vascular, we tend to grade patients on their symptoms. So C1 is just cosmetic spider veins, nothing to worry about at all. C2 is varicose veins, but not causing patients any symptoms. That's still a cosmetic um, uh, classification. But actually, as the inflammation increases, you can get C3, which is edema, C4, which is hemosiderin staining, C5, venous eczema, and C6 in terms of venous ulceration. And in the most simplistic of terms, what's happening with that sustained venous hypertension, you get that higher pressure coming through those veins into that capillary network. And what happens is the blood products start to be forced out through that capillary into that interstitial space, into the tissue. So if you think of the three main products of blood, number one is plasma, water, so it, it results in that edema. The next major product of blood is red blood cells. As the blood, red blood cells leak into that tissue, they start to degrade and dissolve, but they leave behind them their hemoglobin, the iron content, and therefore you get that, red, that brown staining. And then the final product of blood is white blood cells. And actually, when the white blood cells leak into the surrounding tissue, they start to cause a chronic inflammatory response, like having a constant itch. And eventually that can cause the inflammation of the tissue, the venous eczema in terms of the changes of the nutrients and the supply to that skin health. And eventually it can form a venous leg ulcer. I often used to think, I always got how a arterial wound would develop, lack of blood supply, ischemia, cell death wound. But it took me ages to be able to truly understand why having higher pressure in the veins, so in effect greater blood supply, resulted in ulceration. And the answer to that question simply is chronic inflammation. That chronic inflammation starts to change the dynamics of that tissue perfusion and therefore you can lead to that cell death and that formation of that ulceration. All of what you see on these signs are those signs that we're seeing in clinical practice in terms of venous hypertension. The edema, the leakage of that plasma, the changes of that skin, initially that first left picture in terms of that start of venous eczema, very common over that medial gator region, that middle picture, that wet venous eczema that's starting to leak that serous fluid, and then that uncontrolled venous eczema that's happening on that final patient. The problem is with a lot of these patients is actually many patients with venous hypertension are actually diagnosed as having cellulitis. All of these patients you can see were diagnosed as having cellulitis and started on antibiotics. I think we're all aware of the real risk that we have in terms of antimicrobial stewardship and the risk of having antibiotics that are not fit for practice. So we really need to protect those youth. All of these patients that you can see have got signs and symptoms of venous disease. And that's the reason why that they've got that chronic inflammation. They haven't got infection. So when you start to think about what causes venous hypertension, it's simply this cascade. It's this cascade of those damage to those veins, the backfill of those superficial veins, the higher pressure, the dilatation of the veins, the leakage of those, those, those blood products into the surrounding skin, causing that staining, edema, inflammation, skin irritation, and finally that ulceration. So once you start to understand the mechanisms of the disease, it sort of links really clearly to what we need to do to help these patients. I like to think about assessing my patients with venous disease in a simple method of let's assess the patient, the limb and then the wound. So from a patient point of view, you're trying to tease out the symptoms of is this arterial or is this venous? They're the two common um, pathophysiologies for somebody who's got a wound on their lower leg that's not healing. 
So you're trying to tease out those symptoms of are you more likely to be arterial or are you more likely to have a venous um, a, a pathology? So your arterial risk factors are all linked to the risk factors of developing that cardiovascular disease, the reduction of the blood supply, the smoking, the diabetes, the hypertension, the history of other cardiovascular diseases such as heart attacks, ischemic heart disease, strokes, TIAs. But you're much more likely to get a patient of venous disease if they've got previous DVT, if they're inactive, if they've got evidence of visible varicosities, and if they've got a higher BMI. Obviously, this is not a strict black and white, but this is about trying to improve your deductive diagnosis, if you like, in terms of your diagnostic reasoning of likelihood. So we should all start our assessment of that patient from that patient perspective. And then it starts to think about the limb. And there are some great signs of which is more likely to be arterial and which is more likely to be venous. So it's thinking about that limb. Is it showing signs of that venous hypertension? Is it showing signs of edema from that leakage of that plasma? That hemosiderin staining from that breakdown of the hemoglobin from those red blood cells? Am I seeing that chronic red inflammation that's cool to touch around that gator region? Am I showing signs that the skin isn't healthy, that we're getting signs of venous eczema or lipoderma sclerosis, thickening and woodening of that skin in that area? Is there visible varicosities that I can see and feel? And is there any evidence of any wound around the gator region, which is the most likely a location for a venous leg ulcer. And the opposite to that is thinking about what are my signs and symptoms of arterial disease, thinking about the condition and the perfusion of the overall limb and actually arterial wounds are much more common on the foot than actually on the leg itself. And obviously a part of your assessment of a patient when we're thinking about their assessment of the limb should include some form of structured arterial assessment an ankle brachial pressure index, a toe index, a pulse auscultation, and at least a pulse palpation. And then finally, it's about thinking about the wound. Now, if you read a textbook, these are what the signs and symptoms should be of a venous leg ulcer. These are two classic wounds. So a venous leg ulcer should be flat, it should look irregular. There's often high volumes of exudate simply because of that higher pressure within that system and the engorgement of those lymphatics. They tend to happen over a number of weeks. It starts off as a small wound or an itch of skin or eczema and develops into this area of ulceration. And they often have only granulation or sluffy tissue within them. Whereas an arterial wound tends to be more round, more punched out, often dry, can have sloughy or necrotic tissue within it, and it tends to develop relatively quickly. I, I must say, though, um, that I wish venous leg ulcers presented like that and arterial wounds presented like that. Um, in my clinical practice, I do not find that they are so black and white in terms of that description. And I certainly don't think pain is helpful. There is some suggestion that arterial wounds are more painful. Um, arterial wounds are painful, but venous leg ulcers, some patients report significant, terrible pain with relatively small wounds. And then some patients with big circumferential, terrible wounds report no pain at all. And, and that's a real quandary. So therefore, I tend to ignore pain in terms of making it part of my differential diagnosis. So once you've identified the cause of the wound, we need to be thinking about how we treat it. And actually, the focus needs to be that treatment of that chronic venous hypertension, reducing that inflammation and all those blood products leaking out of that surrounding tissue. And the way that we should do that is strong compression plus venous ablation. But we can't forget the other arm of this in terms of how we prepare that wound bed. And I just want to take each of those three separate things in more detail. So 
The first thing is strong compression. Compression therapy has come on leaps and bounds in the last two decades. We have had this explosion, if you like, of options that we've got. And I find all of these absolutely so beneficial. So currently, across many healthcare systems, we have the options of compression hosiery kits, two layer combinations of garments that provide 40 milligrams of mercury pressure at the ankle, sustained pressure, and those can be applied by any practitioner or the patient themselves. Got significant advantages in terms of the patients being able to self-care. And we know that the compression hosiery kits are as good as multi-layer bandaging. So those pictures on that far right side, we've got a traditional four-layer compression bandage and that two-layer compression kit. Both of those are evidence-based. I find the two-layer compression kits really useful because they're dead easy to apply. Many of them have visual indicators so you can't over compress and they require a, a very minimum amount of training to apply. There has been though an explosion over the last decade of the use of the compression wrap systems. I think we've just got to call out at the moment that the compression wrap systems do not have such a strong evidence base compared to the hosiery kits or the compression bandaging. Clinically, we find them great of, of great use, but the empirical evidence is not there at this moment in time. Across the UK, there is a great randomised control study happening, which is called Venus 6, which is a three-way comparison study looking at the use of compression hosiery, multi-layer bandaging and the use of compression wraps. So hopefully in a year from now, I will be able to tell you if they have got a strong evidence base and where they should be positioned. For me though, the thing we can't forget is the foot. And we have great options, including toe caps and foot wraps to make sure that we've got that compression right down to the base of the toes. And we're eliminating those signs of venous hypertension from the toes all the way back up. The one thing I want you to remember about compression therapy though, is that it's got a really high evidence base um, and it's proven to improve patient symptoms and quality of life. And it does it by multiple ways. First off, it starts to push all of that fluid outside of that capillary bed back into the capillary bed. It encourages through massage those lymphatic channels to pick up that extra fluid. It helps to improve that venous return because it brings those valves back together and it helps to all, overall increase tissue perfusion. So I'd like you to see compression therapy as an anti-inflammatory device. It's a very strong anti-inflammatory device that's going to reduce that local inflammation that's causing this venous leg ulcer. And you can see that patient there has got a classic venous leg ulcer with large volumes of edema, large amounts of inflammation and desperately in need of strong compression therapy to be able to eliminate all of that. And a wound like that with strong compression therapy on, you will get that wound to heal within a matter of weeks, never mind months. But if you think compression therapy is only like a palliative approach, it's only really supporting that veins while ever it's in place. And actually what we need to be doing with each of our patients is considering, is there a curative procedure that can actually eliminate that venous hypertension completely and therefore aid ulcer healing and prevent the risk of recurrence? So there is a way, easy way to do this. We, many um, vascular clinics now do same day venous duplex scanning within a clinic department. And what we're trying to find is, is there any area of reflux within that superficial uh, venous system? Because if there is, we have venous intervention techniques which are minimally invasive. It's a procedure where you walk in, walk out. A little bit of Emla cream, local anaesthetic. We put a catheter inside that superficial vein. We collapse that superficial vein. Therefore, we're really turning down the tap of that venous hypertension. And we're able to get fantastic results with this procedure. 
And if you remember how we started this talk about that, that, ve that venous system, the majority of the blood returns by that deep venous system. You can actually live very well indeed without this superficial vein. So by us intervening on it, we've simply reduced the amount of pressure within that venous system. We're going to prevent that capillary bed from getting so engorged. We're going to reduce that inflammation and we're going to cure that patient of their long term condition. And we know that that's of use because of that Evra study. I mentioned it at the start of this. Venus in, in intervention is evidence based and we know this through a multi-centre study of over 450 patients in many vascular centres that simply compared the use of compression therapy plus the use of compression therapy with early vein intervention and we were easily able to demonstrate the fact that actually if we intervene on these veins we have a healing rate of around 85% at 24 weeks and you reduce the time from healing by using intervention of the vein and compression by about 30 days. So if you had venous hypertension and you had a leg ulcer, would you rather be in compression for the rest of your life? Or would you rather have a quick day case procedure that's going to eliminate the chance, well, going to reduce the chances of your ulcer ever occurring? I know which I would choose. And I think we've got to all understand that there are very good treatments for the treatment of venous hypertension in many healthcare organisations today. So I've talked a lot about the use of actually getting rid of the venous hypertension through compression or vein intervention. But we cannot forget the importance of that good wound bed preparation at the same time. Because actually, if you're getting that compression in place, we really need to be thinking about how do we prepare that wound bed for healing? My favourite um, thing that I've ever been involved in is, is timer. And, and times is a way of really providing a structured, methodological, coherent and systematic approach to wound bed assessment. And it's simply five questions. Is the tissue deficient or um, vi non-viable? In other words, do I need to remove it? Is there any evidence of infection or inflammation? Do I need to control that inflammation or reduce that bio burden? It's about M, thinking about what's the moisture that balance. Is the wound bed too dry? In venous leg ulcer management, often the two wound bed is too wet. So it's thinking about how do we manage those high volumes of exudate? And then it's about thinking about the wound edge. Are they truly advancing or not? Are they undermined? Have we got these steep cliff edges where we haven't got the epithelial migration? And then finally thinking, if we've got all that in place, how do we encourage repair? How do we encourage tissue regeneration? Because we've got lots of options in our toolkit today. So if you haven't read it, I'd encourage you to have a read of this international consensus document. It's called Implementing Time as the Race Against Hard to Heal Wounds. It really goes over a lot of the things that I've been talking about today in terms of the importance of that accurate diagnosis, that treatment of the underlying cause, and then focus on this wound bed. So just for my last 10 minutes or so, I just want to focus really on that tissue side of this because within patients of venous leg ulceration you often get non-viable tissue and in terms of when I say non-viable tissue what I really mean I mean tissue that's died from cellular death so that can either be necrotic tissue black tissue like seen on that top image or it can be sloughy tissue seen on that bottom image which is a product of normal inflammation but it often becomes a problem with chronic wound management. And this decellulized tissue that we can see is basically a barrier to wound healing. It consists of fibrins, white blood cells, many elements of bacteria, debris, dead tissue, all of this, if you like, is hindering that wound bed from regenerating. Non-viable tissue comes in many forms. All of this is a part of non-viable tissue. 
It ranges from necrotic tissue all the way down to superficial sloughy tissue. But I'm sure all of you would recognise the one thing we need to do with each of these patients is to remove that necrotic tissue. And when we're talking about with venous leg ulceration, I often think that whenever we're in a position and we've got non-viable tissue, we're sort of in a minus position. We need to get that wound bed debrided as soon as we possibly can to get to, if you like, week zero, and then healing can start to occur. So how do we get rid of this? How do we eliminate this in our practice? Well, we need to remove it. And you'll have all heard of the wound debridement. But I bet you don't know actually was invented by, the, the saying debridement was invented by this um, handsome young gentleman back in uh, 1685. And it's a French word, debridement, and it's about removing constraint. It's often um, used in terms of bridles for horses. Um, but that's been, it's been evolutionary, if you like, in terms of how we've used it um, within wound care. And I think every one of us now knows the importance of debridement. The European Wound Management Association really said that we need to be focused on that removal of that devitalised tissue. We need to try to separate this to clean the wound as, such, as soon as possible because we know that's our first cornerstone of providing good wound bed preparation. So when we think about debridement we really need to think about why in terms of the biggest why. Well there's many reasons why. First off, that devitalised tissue sometimes can mask or even mimic the signs of infection. It can be quite smelly. It can actually increase the levels of exudate. It certainly is covering that wound. Therefore, it's really difficult to provide an accurate wound bed assessment of how deep does that wound go. Whatever that tissue is in place, that sloughy devitalised tissue, you're going to increase that chronic inflammatory response on the wound bed itself, you're going to have an increased amount of MMPs and cytokines. And, and it really hinders the activations of the cells at the edge of the wound where healing starts to occur. But just imagine having that on you if you were that patient. What would that do in terms of how you would feel about your cleanliness, your quality of life? How could you cope with that leakage, that odour, that exudate from that? So we've got a huge role in terms of debriding that as soon as possible. So this is a patient with a venous leg also, and you can see there's quite a big void of devitalised tissue in that patient. And what we needed to do was to stimulate wound healing as quick as we possibly can. So with that patient, we used topical um, larval therapy to aid debridement of that. But you can see the benefits of that rapid debridement. You've already, with one or two applications, you've actually uncovered that capillary wound bed. You can now see the starts of the wound healing. You've stimulated those wound edges. You can start to see the granulation tissue coming up. So we really need to focus on that debridement. There are many options of debridement um, in today's world. Um, but what you need to think about is how quick can we do this? So when I first started wound care and lava therapy was introduced, there were all free range. And, and, and we, believe it or not, we used to think we had to count them in and count them out. And, and it was like whack-a-mole with maggots. I loved using free range maggots. But they were difficult to use. But quite a while ago now, Biomon decided to make their application and removal much easier for clinicians. And they're now placed within this bio bag, this protective tea bag, if you like. And I was a little um, confused, I must say, when they did this, because I actually thought a maggot had teeth and I actually thought that they bit and debrided the wound bed by, by eating it. And actually, the science behind the larvae is that they don't have teeth. In effect, they've got two straws. And what they do is they spit enzymatic fluid onto the wound bed, which dissolves the devitalised tissue. It actually eliminates a lot of the bacteria, but doesn't affect any of the healthy granulation tissue. And then they suck that dissolved fluid back through their straws. 
and that's why they can be highly effective while still in this tea bag. It makes the use of them a lot easier in terms of how we apply them, how we remove them. And I do think patients like them more knowing that you're not going to have any escapees. If you think, though, of your options of debridement, many of you will instantly turn to dressings to autolytically debride a wound. But as you know, in practice, that can take time. And if you think again about having a clean wound bed as day zero, we really need to think about hastening this approach as quick as we possibly can to get that clean wound bed. There's been a great publication, the consensus document from Wounds UK, looking at the role of larva therapy and the debridement of specifically of lower limb wounds directed at venous ulceration. And there's been many advantages documented within this document about how the larval therapy are fantastic at debridement, their speed of debridement. The fact that they are able to reduce the bacteria, including MRSA, Strep A, Strep B, Staph, and even Pseudomonas and Biofilms. And we're all aware that they can hinder the healing of a venous leg ulcer. But there's also some great science in terms of how they actually stimulate the activation of that new granulation and growth. So if you're not aware, please, please download that document. Hopefully we'll be able to put the link up for you. Have a look in terms of this beautiful pathway that's been written. It goes through actually where we need to focus in terms of that complete holistic assessment, looking at that pathophysiology, eliminating the pathophysiology, but then really focused on that wound bed assessment and wound bed preparation and thinking about where can we use larval therapy. There's really little side effects to the use of larval therapy. We know that we can leave them in place for a number of days. You can use these as an adjunct treatment. You can use them under compression and I've done that successfully in many, many of the patients. It's actually a bit of a common myth that we desperately need to change these or rehydrate these on a daily basis. That's good practice if we can, but we certainly know that they will live very well without that under the compression therapy. There's many advantages of them, but it's about thinking about where do we use them well. And to me, it needs to be this combination of thinking about cleansing that venous leg ulcer, thinking about the placement of that bio bag, and then thinking about how we put that compression therapy over the top. And within the document, we break it down to really think about, you've got three options. You could temporarily suspend the compression therapy and think about other ways such as elevation and eliminating the, the venous hypertension. But we recommend that that should only be on a short term temporary basis. There's clear guidance that you can continue um, to use compression bandaging that you can keep that bio bag in place for up to four days without any issue whatsoever. And then there is a consideration of, could you use some other form of compression to allow that daily rehydration of that bio bag, if at all possible? So it's about thinking about how you use this strong therapy in combination with that strong compression therapy, thinking about moving your patient through that journey towards healing. So just to summarise, I hope that I give you a bit of a whistle stop tour about venous disease and venous hypertension. I hope I've reiterated with you that actually the first step of good management is timely diagnosis. Getting it right first time, recognising and treating that venous hypertension is step one of management of these patients. And that treatment should be strong compression therapy in combination with a consideration of venous intervention. But when you've done all of that, the focus needs to be on wound bed preparation. You need to drag that patient as soon as you can to that day zero of having a clean granulating wound bed because then healing will occur. Think about and focus on your debridement. Think about the options that you have and consider could larva therapy be one of your considered options because it's highly selective form of debridement, extremely rapid and provides an overall cost effective approach. If you're interested to hear more, please download the documents that I've been speaking about today and I'll welcome any questions.
Thank you for listening. Well, presentation, I really enjoyed it and I hope everybody at home did as well. Um, and I should say at this stage, um, if uh, you didn't join us on uh, Dr. Leanne Atkins' previous webinar, um, you actually did a wonderful webinar for us, Leanne, back in October on uh, peripheral arterial disease as well. So that is actually up on our YouTube channel. So if anybody is interested, do go and please watch that um, after this evening. So now it's time for your questions, everybody. So we'll just, um, and at this point in the webinar, I am going to invite my colleague, uh, Vicky Phillips, on to join us as well. Uh, Vicky's the clinical support manager here at Biomond, so if you do have any questions specifically in relation to larval therapy, Vicky can help to answer those for you as well. And I'll just put the links up to those documents that I referred to whilst we're speaking. Oh, lovely, brilliant. Thank you, Leanne. So the first question that's come through for you um, is for you, Leanne. Um, it's from Jackie. She's asking, so once um, a patient has had intervention with their ulcer, um, would this still be the need for compression later on if they presented with a chronic wound? So if, if uh, whatever a patient has got a, a venous leg ulcer, in fact, many patients with a lower limb wound will benefit from compression. If a patient has got a venous leg ulcer, that patient needs to be on compression until point of healing. Whether they have surgery or not, that strong compression should be sustained. But we know if we intervene on the veins, that healing time will be quicker. And we know that we reduce the risk of recurrence going forward. That's a great question that she's asked, because actually there is still a question about if you've had vein intervention, do you need compression therapy on a long term preventative basis? And the answer is still slightly uncertain, but probably not. So it's about using um, that that compression therapy and then seeing what signs and symptoms you've got. To me, it often depends on what type of venous disease I'm seeing. So if I've got a pure venous leg ulcer on a patient with a skinny leg with some hemocytamine staining, you heal them in compression, you do the vein intervention, that's been successful technically, probably not. But if you've got a patient with large volumes of edema and big circumferential leg ulcers and you heal them in compression, and you do the vein intervention, I think those patients are still going to require compression on a long-term basis to manage their edema element of their disease. And so those patients will probably need to be in long compression. But what you do certainly do is to reduce their risk of recurrence going forward. Because remember, just because you're in compression on a long-term basis doesn't mean you're not going to recur. So you're reducing those risks by about two thirds by intervening on those veins. Brilliant. Thank you for answering that one. Uh, the next question is probably of a similar vein. So apologies if it does overlap slightly. Um, but uh, somebody's asking about a, a patient with an ulcer um, and if they want to use hoisery at the same time. Um, should they wait to treat the ulcer until it heals completely and start wearing hoisery afterwards? Or would they wear the hoisery from the very beginning of the ulcer treatment? So I, I think that just be careful in terms of how we say hosiery. So Hosiery comes in many different forms. There are hosiery kits that provide 40 milligrams of mercury pressure, the same as a traditional compression bandage. And then there is class one, two and three compression hosiery that provides a lesser degree of compression. So only good in maintenance, not good in healing. Have a look at, at um, it, it's called Rebecca Ashby's Venus study. It was published in the Lancet quite in 2014. They are able to demonstrate that if you use compression hosiery kits that provide 40 milligrams of mercury pressure, you can use them day one of venous ulceration. You can use them instead of compression bandaging from day one with the same efficacy. I've got always got slight, slight caveats to everything I say. The one thing I'd say to that is compression hosiery are only good in a normal looking leg. If you've got a leg that's got gross edema or is got an unusual shape, the hosiery is not going to fit it right. Also, if you've got high volumes of exudate, you're going to need that compression bandaging to help with some of the wicking of the exudate. But certainly if you've got a smallish venous leg ulcer in a normal looking ish leg. You can go into compression hosiery from day one and that will heal your venous leg ulcer as good as multilayer compression bandaging. Brilliant. Thank you. 
Um, so the next question that's come through for you, Leanne, um, is uh, Kathleen is asking, on reflection, could you recommend or advise on inflammation versus infection? Um, she said in chronic venous ulcers, old, older clients who are immobile, she's um, tended to suspect infection where the pain score is increased. When she's asking, would you swab first or would you try anti-inflammatories as a first option there? So what a great question. If I had the answer to this, I think I think I might not be sat here. I might be on a beach somewhere, if you <laughs> like. Just to break that down, let's remember that infection is caused by bacteria. And infection causes an inflammatory response. But you can have an inflammatory response without the bacteria. So you start to understand why they are becoming mixed, if you like. So what you need to do is to tease out the classic signs of infection, the heat, the redness, the spreading erythema, the clear demarcation, the patient feeling unwell, the lethargy, the temperature, the raised white cell count, raised ESRs, raised CRPs. So it's using your greatest diagnostic tool set, if you like, to find those signs and symptoms. I would only start patients on systemic antibiotics if I was very clear they had cellulitis in terms of spreading inflammation and infection. If though I had a wound where you've got some subtle signs and you've got this inflammatory chronic response, I wouldn't give them antibiotics. For that group of patients, I may decide to take a wound swab. Even if the wound swab shows some form of bacteria, it doesn't necessarily mean they may need antibiotics. But if I'd eliminated everything else, if they're in good compression and the chronic inflammation is still there and you've got a positive uh, group B strep, I might provide them some targeted treatment. I think we just all need to remember to justify our use of antibiotics in a very detailed form. If you've got chronic inflammation that's been there for a long period of time and you've had course of antibiotics and it's not made any difference, I'd say try some compression because compression is a fantastic anti-inflammatory device too. And just to plug another document, there's a fantastic uh, document about consensus about red legs, the complexities of diagnosis that's just been published. And that's a lovely A memoir at the end of that. It sort of goes through what different clinical presentations can be provided and can result in mimics to infection, but not actually infection. I'll find that link and put that up too. Oh, amazing. Thank you, Leanne. Um, so the next question for you again, Leanne, um, from Goldie. She's asking, do you think there is an evidence protein deficiency affects delayed healing in venous ulceration? Um, I think the answer to that is probably yes. If you look at that science, it's emerging more and more that that's probably the answer. But that question comes from somebody, I would say, who's working really at the top end of the game. The problem is, I completely agree, but actually, if you look at the whole population, who is that being affected by? It's probably only less than 5% of the whole ulcer group that's out there. And, 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 you know, that's really complex science and really interesting. But I think we've got to remember that the majority of patients that we see with venous leg ulceration will be healed with simple, strong compression, venous ablation and good wound bed preparation. And, and I know that there's lots of advanced techniques that we could do in terms of cellular stuff. But actually, nine times out of ten, they just need good evidence based fundamental care and you will get these patients to heal. I think there is something, though, about if you've done the compression, the venous ablation, and the good wound pre preparation, and you're not healing in a timely fashion. I think then we do need to escalate these patients sooner in their pathway to experts, uh, such as who asked that question, to be able to take that more detailed analysis in terms of, you know, the, 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 the tissue um, um, uh, biopsies, um, the tissue um, microbiology, looking at those specific proteins, looking at those specific gene factors, undertaking more detailed venous scans. I think that that's required but only for a tiny proportion of patients. I think for the majority of patients, we just need to get the fundamentals right. And in, in a way, you could sort of really eliminate chronic ulceration of the future if we just 
every every patient that you're seeing at this moment in time with that big complex circumferential venous leg ulcer that's taking loads of time resource and is really impacting that patient's quality of life that started off as a tiny small simple ulcer and you have to question did we fail them because we ignored that and imagine if we had to treat that patient right, very when it was small and superficial, we could have got it to heal within a matter of weeks rather than a matter of months and months and years and years. So true. Thank you, Leanne. Um, now, the next question from Magda is probably one for both of you to share between you. Um, and Magda is asking, do either of you have experience with wounds turning completely black before debridement is visible with larvae? Um, Magda said it seems at first so the wounds might be worsening, but they're not eventually in the end. And she's wondering what could be the cause of this. Mm. Well, I must say I haven't seen that in my clinical practice, but it's really interesting because I don't know where it's coming from at the moment, and the, the, this is sort of my question to, to Biamon. I normally just put my bag of larvae on. Yeah. Don't take it off. Just keep rehydrating it on a daily basis and remove it. I've heard many people now telling me that we have to turn the bag. Oh, no. No, a, a, you don't a, need to turn the bag. <laughs> a, a rotating bag. And no. I wonder if that's... Um, you know does that give an, an, an opportunity to inspect the wound bed on a daily basis and therefore you're seeing these subtle changes i don't know but but for me i i, I leave the munching until the thaw, yeah. and i don't like to disturb them because i think they're having a lovely time so the only time we did used to tell people to rotate the dressing was when do you remember we had the old biofoam oh yeah um, and you had to ro rotate that but with the bags you've never had to do that so um maybe that's just a, something that's been resurrected i'm not sure um with regards to the tissue turning black though it's funny because we had this come up the other day um with one of our colleagues and i've been pondering about it and the only thing i can think is the because the exudate is quite discolored you get it's all that dark brown reddy color that maybe it's staining the divitalized tissue um because yeah that's the only other time that i've seen that happen and, and that's the only other only thing i can think um so yeah interesting one magda if you find out what's going on then let us know lovely thank you both for answering that one uh, the next question has come through again from Goldie um, she's asking Leanne what advice would you have in terms of treatment on somebody with a category 4 ulcer okay so, so um, obviously that, that's you, you're referring to a pressure ulcer remember if it's a leg ulcer we don't categorize depth on it whatsoever so um, I've heard clinicians before trying to categorise leg ulcers like we categorise um, or, or classify pressure ulcers. There is no known robust categorization. So all you describe is depth and tissue type. Um, so, but it's also the question is in relation to pressure ulcers. So um, once you have a category four pressure ulcer, you know, you have significant tissue void. And for me, I'm not a tissue viability nurse, so I do not get involved in pressure ulcers on the bums or anywhere else. But I certainly get involved in pressure ulcers of the heels. And, and the heel is extremely vulnerable for deep pressure ulcers, whether it might be a deep tissue injury, an unstageable or a category four. And the reasons for that is because the heel is such a, a, a complex structure, if you like. Um, and it's protected by fat pads that sit in like little um, uh, honeycombs and, and they've got their own little protection of fat around them. And many patients, as they become unwell, they lose that fat padding. So therefore the heel becomes very instantly at risk of shear and friction and, and direct pressure. If you've got a wound as a, as a category four pressure ulcer, um, the first thing we need to do is eliminate the pressure, 100%, that's where your focus needs to be. But again, I come back to, if you've got a devitalized sloughy wound bed that many of these are that you're wondering is it down to calcaneum or not and what is the viability of that tissue you're at day nine you're here and what we need to do is to debride you as quick as possible to get you to day zero to then to be able to assess your healing potential heal pressure ulcers are devilments to debride um, because they're often circular and you can't do it with a scalpel because there's so many structures there you just can't get in 
what's beauty about a heel pressure ulcer is they're just about the right size to pop a little bio bag in and you can you protect the bio bag beautifully because often the, the category four pressure ulcer is a cavity so don't worry about pressure from them because you'll find that you're actually just protecting that 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 larvae because they're sat in the cavity quite nicely remember the maggots like to eat so therefore they'll sit at the base of the wound they won't try to escape until they've done if you like they won't move uh, from the base of that tissue you know it's like trying to get me away from a piece of carrot cake i'm not going until it's finished um, and and the larvae are exactly the same oh brilliant thank you very much leanne um and the next question that's come through from jackie and i do apologize jackie i'm not sure of the context of, of what you mean here but leanne you probably will know much better than i do i'll have um, a go Jack Jackie has written a uh, 40 mg compression only after Doppler. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so have a look. Um, this is UK based only. We produce a national wound care strategy, and the national wound care strategy says quite clearly you can assess for red flags. The red flags is critical limb ischemia, DVT, skin cancers, um, infection, and sepsis. You can screen for the red flags. If you've got no red flags, and the wound is on the leg, you can put on 20 millimetres of mercury compression without any form of formal vascular assessment. So no foot, foot pull patient, no Doppler, no ABPI, no toe pressure, red flag assessment, you can put on 20 millimetres of mercury. But absolutely, before you go on to that strong compression, there needs to be a formal vascular assessment. And that formal vascular assessment should be something that is very specific. So not pulse palpation, it should be ankle brachial pressure index, toe absolute pressure or toe brachial index before you put that on. And you'll find that that's, that guidance in terms of making sure that we have no unknown um, art peripheral arterial disease is, is present in the majority of, of the documentation across the globe. So you need to make sure that your ABPI is between 0.8 and 1.3 and therefore you've excluded peripheral arterial disease. If your ABPI is below 0.8, you're going to need some form of other assessment and compression maybe need to be reduced or no compression at all. If you've got an ABPI above, above 1.3, those patients are still going to need some compression. It's just about using a different form of tool to assess if they've got any underlying peripheral arterial disease because of arterial disease calcification. If you're interested to that, link onto the YouTube channel, have a look at the last video we covered about peripheral arterial disease assessment on my last webinar with Biomont. Oh, brilliant. Thanks, Leanne. Um, and the question you answered previously from Goldie about the category four ELSA. I do apologise, Goldie. That was probably me misinterpreting what you meant in your question. Um, Goldie has written, sorry, I don't mean pressure ulcers. I mean a C4 venous disease. Ah, C-E-A-P okay. classification C4. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so uh, the, the C... The C just means clinical presentation at the end of the day. So it's just a documentation about the, 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 the progression of the disease. It's edema, skin staining, um, venous eczema, and, and then venous leg ulceration. So anybody with venous leg ulceration has got the end stage venous disease, if you like. So those are the patients that really we've been focusing on throughout the whole of this. Um, those patients need the strong compression, the venous ablation and good wound bed preparation. Oh, perfect. Thank you, Leanne. And the last question of the evening then has come through from Samantha. Um, she's a student working on her dissertation, focusing on venous leg ulcers. And she's asking if you could recommend any further literature to help her in her research, please. Oh, yeah, I could be here all night. <laughs> OK, a, a couple of, uh, of seminal publications that you need to look at in terms of prevalence. The Julian Guest paper from 2015. The Julian Guest paper again from 2020. Also, the paper by um, Hall in 2014. It was one that looked at prevalence actually in the population in the community setting in Leeds. Their prevalence data is a lot lower than the Julian Guest, but that'll provide some great critical analysis for your dissertation of why they got different figures within it. Um, the, you, the main part of your thesis, look at Cochrane and, and look at the amount of randomised controlled trials in terms of Cochrane. Um, venus uh, 
2004, um, Rebecca Ashby and Co from 2014, look at Evra in terms of the Venus ablation stuff, and then don't forget the Christine Moffat stuff, she's published absolutely loads, Professor Christine Moffat, she really talks about the impact of the quality of life side, and don't forget to bring that in, in terms of, of your management. Um, it depends on your focus of your actual dissertation and what you're wanting to do, but some of those will give you a very good insight in, in terms of how to how to frame uh, your research question. Oh, fab. Thank you so much, Liam. Um, so that's it for the questions, everybody. Um, but thank you for all of those questions and thank you to Leanne and Vicky for answering them so brilliantly. Um, so thank you everybody for joining us we really hope you've enjoyed um and as we've said we do host our get expert guest webinars regularly this wasn't leanne's first webinar she's done one previously um for us and um we are going hopefully going to be doing a, a little bit of a vascular series with leanne as well this year so keep your eyes peeled for more in the future and if there's anything that you want us to cover and um, you know just put some suggestions and send the team and buy them on a link if there's anything that you think oh i could really do with an update of that and um, you know we're, we're really really welcome to listen to your ideas oh wonderful yeah no that's a great suggestion thanks leanne um and obviously if you've enjoyed the webinar this evening we do have further remote learning options for you um we've got biomon now which is our um, online video library um we've then got the biomon academy which is a uh, bite-sized e-learning modules and then we've got biomon direct which is hosted by vicky and those are one-to-one -one training consultations and all of those resources can be accessed via our website biomon.com now, if you do have any questions specifically for myself, Vicky, or anyone in the Biomon team, um, do please reach out to us. We've got our clinical helpline number, which is on the screen for you. Um, as I've said, you can also visit us via our website. And we do have an email as well, specifically for clinical inquiries. So if you have any questions, do please send us an email. And we are on social media as well. We're on every social media platform you can possibly imagine. <laughs> so do please uh, pop us a like, pop us a comment and, and follow us on there as well. It would be great to see you. But that's it from us, everybody. Um, uh, just a huge thank you from me to, to Leanne for the presentation this evening. It's been great. Um, I really enjoyed it and I hope everyone else did as well. And thank you both to both of you for the questions as well that you've answered and to everybody at home. Um, it's been wonderful to have your company and we hope to see you again on another webinar very soon. Thank you, everybody. Good evening. Bye, all.